What is going on, Diesel Nation? We're excited to have you guys with us today on the Diesel Podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube and not subscribed, make sure you click the subscribe button, turn on notifications, like and comment. Let us know what you think of the episode. If there's another topic or guest that you would like us to cover, we're always checking YouTube comments, and we appreciate your support on there and helping us reach more people. Uh, they're looking for either help with their truck or they have questions and YouTube is a great platform to be able to, to find those. Today's guest is going to be Vinny Himes from Leadfoot Diesel Performance. Uh, he was on in the beginning part of August, we were talking about emissions and uh, what he deals with as far as working at a shop. And I wanted him on again today to chat with us about two questions that I have seen a lot from you guys. And one is what can we do to maintain our emission systems? Are there things that we can do, be proactive to help the EGR, the DPF not get clogged and last as long as possible? Or is there nothing out there? Is it just, it is what it is and we got to deal with it. So I'm going to ask him that question. The second one is about returning a vehicle to stock. So if you know, somebody bought a truck and it was deleted and now they need to register it, but it has to be put back to stock, what does that cost? What goes into it? How available are the parts? Is it something that's easily done, not easy to do? So Vinny's worked in the diesel industry for quite a long time at a bunch of different levels. And these are things he you know deals with every single day. So I thought it'd be a great time for us to be able to chat, get those questions answered for you guys. Before we get to it, though, I want to remind you guys, our friends over at Kershaw Knives have a, dis a discount code. Save 20% off site wide. Just use code diesel20 at kershaw.kiausa.com. It's a great way to save some money on EDC, hunting, fishing knives, tons of gear that they have, and we appreciate them offering that discount code just for you guys. It's something exclusive to the Diesel Podcast. All right, let's get to today's chat with Vinny and asking about how do we maintain our emission systems, and if we have to put our truck back to stock, how much does that really cost? Vinny, we meet again on the Diesel Podcast. I'm excited to chat with you today. I appreciate uh, the episode we did in early August talking about uh, the diesel industry and shops, and I know a ton of people saw that on YouTube and podcast apps. And today's episode is going to kind of be like that, but a little bit different. So I appreciate you taking time this evening, chatting with us. And uh, I know you're going to drop some knowledge on me. So I learned some things along the way. Absolutely, man. Happy to be on. I, I wanted to start with this because it's such, it's a lot of questions that, that we've gotten about it is either how do I maintain my emission systems or I just bought this truck. I need to put it back to stock or I just need to return it to stock. How do I do it? And I wanted to have you start by talking a bit about your your history in the diesel industry, what you've done. So when you're walking through these things with us, we know the tremendous amount of experience and the expertise that you have in different parts of diesel, not just the performance side or the maintenance side or you know even the emission side, but just everything in general. Sure. No, uh, my, uh, my diesel experience started at a very young age. Um, I mean, I grew up on a cattle ranch in montana you know uh my parents helped out working on a cattle ranch i helped out working on a cattle ranch everything we had on the ranch was diesel from tractors to pick up trucks and uh you know part of your daily duties on the ranch was keeping this stuff running and um probably one of my most extensive and uh where i really got bit by the bug and saw this as a viable career choice uh 16 years old, I worked at a company called Bitterroot Timber Frames in uh, Stevensville, Montana. We had a fleet of Caterpillar diesel tractors, telehandlers, loaders. Uh, we were loading and unloading logging trucks, um, you know, moving big heavy beams around. And we used a Caterpillar TH83 telehandler was the first piece of heavy machinery that I got to play around with as a 16 year old kid. And uh, we hired a new guy. And he was worthless. I mean, he, you know, he could pull air in and push air out. And that was about all he was good for. But we kept trying to find odd jobs that this retard could do. And and one of the things we decided to try and task him with was every morning, you know, check the oil, check the fuel filters, fire these things up. It's Montana. It's cold. It's 32 below zero in the wintertime. So he was supposed to go through, get the whole lineup of machinery started and running and fill them all up with diesel fuel, top off the oil, what have you. And he decided to fill all of them up with gasoline. We had two big, huge 1,500-gallon uh, or 1500 gallon above ground diesel tanks, uh, one diesel, one gas. We had a lot of chainsaws, and, and our sawmill that we ran was gas-powered. He grabbed the wrong handle, filled up the tractors with the wrong fuel, and 
blew up a bunch of motors, damaged a bunch of fuel systems. And the owner of the company, you know, we're in the middle of nowhere, Montana. There's not a diesel shop around the corner. There's not a mobile diesel tech that could come out and see us for weeks. And we needed these machines back up and running immediately. And so I literally got the old Caterpillar manual and tore down a bunch of motors and put them back together at 16 years old. And I actually enjoyed that more than building log homes, which is what I was supposed to be doing at the time. Um, and then from there, it pretty much just snowballed into what it is today, a full-time job. But I started tinkering with seven threes back in early 2000s. My first personal vehicle at 16 years old was a 99 F350 extended cab, long bed, single rear wheel with a manual transmission. And I put a super chips on it and thought it was the fastest thing on earth. I mean, you couldn't tell me nothing. I was 16. So, uh, that's kind of where it started. Um, segued into starting my own company at 20 years old building timber frame homes in northern idaho my entire fleet of trucks i was building the log homes and timber frame homes at my home base in idaho and i was delivering those packages to jackson hole wyoming uh, big sky montana vale colorado lake tahoe nevada so all of our houses were pretty much on ski resorts or ski resort towns and so I had to build them in Idaho at our yard and then load the house on trailers and take it up to the mountains where it was going to get assembled. And so just once again, out of necessity, I had to learn how to work on those trucks because you took it to the dealership and let it sit there for a month and they misdiagnose it and just shotgun parts at it. Or you figure it out yourself and you learn. And so I would say probably one of my greatest mentors in the diesel industry, the guy that taught me the most and had the most patience with me and, and really broke things down to a molecular level was Brady from industrial injection. I mean, that guy was a rock star. Um, so my career in the diesel industry started at 25 when I broke my back. So I've been tinkering with diesels at that point for almost 10 years. Uh, everything from Huey injected power strokes to common rail D uh, five nines and Lots of 12-valve knowledge. We had a huge 12-valve presence in northern Idaho. I can't tell you how many hundreds of fuel plates I ground in my garage, you know, for a 16-year-old kid that just got his grandpa's old truck kind of a thing. And so that, what was a hobby turned into a career once I got hurt and broke my back. And that's when I went to work at Alligator Performance and uh, quickly, quickly grew that place Uh from a husband and wife team to 25 sales guys and, and just doing astronomical numbers. So the sales side of it's fun. Um, it's a different angle. I definitely prefer getting in there and getting my hands dirty and holding her onto a wrench, but uh, the sales stuff's cool. And um, after I left Alligator, I, I did a very short stint in Washington state for a shop up there that was actually an emissions test facility. And um, so I had to learn a whole different side of it um, going there, you know, keeping missions intact and figuring out how to make fuel economy and horsepower with that. So pretty broad knowledge of 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 all of it. Um, you know, now here we are uh, in Georgia and we're back to uh, making horsepower with emissions intact and uh, using Carbio certified products and not, you know, we haven't spoken of or talked about deletes in our shop in a long time years and um it's industry it, it's interesting because back when we basically were made aware that we can no longer do deletes it's illegal you know whatever none of us is uh formally trained in the study of law we're hillbillies and rednecks that were ranchers and loggers that are now working at a diesel shop so it was interesting to see um uh, what their Attempting to very poorly enforce, uh, really interesting to see how little the officers that showed up at our shop knew. Uh, I asked a lot of questions when they were there and got zero answers. So a little bit frustrating on that part. But, uh, you know, every every time I watch an episode here, I learn a little bit more. So your podcast has been your podcast has been more helpful to me understanding the law than the actual law enforcement officers themselves that I dealt with. It's been really interesting, you know, covering it. And I think your episode, you know, kind of kicked it off for us in early August. And then we progressed to, um, you know, different parts of it, chatting with a lawyer, chatting with Corey Willis and Ryan Milliken and <clears throat> other yeah. 
you know, people and their differing experiences in it. And one of the common questions people will ask is they'll say, hey, I intend on keeping this emissions compliant, but how do I make it last? And I think that's the overwhelming prevailing part of this that I think has always existed for the majority of people going back to 2007 and a half was you buy diesel because you want to put three, four, five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand miles on it. You want it to last. That's why you didn't buy the gas truck. You want the torque. Um, you, you need the towing capacity, the payload capacity, and the emission system is always seen as the weakest point. Um, I don't think anyone buys a Cummins Duramax or Power Stroke and thinks, well, the engine's going to give way before the DPF does or the EGR valve or right. EGR cool or something like that. So on, you know, with your experience, what are some ways that people can help to maintain the emission systems or just you know, <laughs> keep it happy? What do you guys see there in the shop? You know, uh, it's a, it's a very obvious pattern and it's the, uh, it's the guy that's owned the diesel his whole life for no reason. That's having problems. Um, the guys that are, out there hot shot trucking the guys that are working these trucks they're hauling excavators horse trailers every single day they're they're call, hauling a car hauling wedge trailer what have you we don't work on those trucks and we definitely don't work on them often um, we're seeing more fuel system failures out of those vehicles than we are emissions system failures so the big picture here and the and the dead giveaway to that is pressure and heat is king so if you can keep it hot and if you can keep the boost numbers up and the RPMs up, the stuff stays relatively clean and it works as it was an en engineered to work. Where it doesn't work is Grandpa John driving the trash can down to the end of the two mile driveway at the homestead every Thursday afternoon. You know, that thing's just going to be in the shop its whole life. Um, the guy, you know, driving 10 miles to an office job every morning and 10 miles home at night. That's me. Um, you know. <laughs> It's not going to work. So you, these things need to get out. They need to stretch their legs. And uh, if they can do that, they'll live. So to answer your question and to answer your viewer's question, uh, the guys that are driving 10 minutes to an office job, how do you keep it alive? Uh, the number one product that I've found helpful, and I don't understand why it doesn't get talked about more, is water methanol injection. Uh, when I was in Washington State working at the emissions uh, test facility shop there, uh, Obviously, the owner's very well known. He's been in business for 25 years. Super good people. Um, one of the one of the more fun shops I've worked at. And um, you know, we just had to figure things out. You know, you can't just tell the customer, "Oh, well, you're screwed. Sorry, the government hates your vehicle." You know, you got to figure things out. You got to innovate. You got to look. You got to understand the science behind this thing. Uh, why does it clog up? Why doesn't it regen properly? And once you can educate, first steps educating the customer. Once you educate the customer. You know, that's when the customer can say, OK, well, I understand now uh, if I if I see that it's going into region, if I hear that it's going into region as I'm pulling up to the house at night, I'm going to jump back on the interstate and go for a, you know, 25 minute jaunt at 70 miles an hour and let this thing clean out before I shut it down. So that's king right there. If, if people understand that, that's the first step to having a successful, happy relationship with a 07 and newer diesel truck. Um, if you do that and you're still having problems water methanol injection. Um, it's magic. It, it just works. So water methanol injection is an injectable that it's windshield washer fluid for lack of a better term. That's what I ran. I ran water methanol injection on all my trucks back in the mid to late 2000s before emissions was even a thing. I was running water methanol to combat EGTs at high elevation. Um, I was hot shot in all over northern Montana, Colorado, Wyoming. It's just it's steep mountains and there's no air. So uh, water methanol injection helped me cool my EGTs down. And what I found after putting 300 and some odd miles on a truck and flipping it over and letting it run till it died, um, we tore the engine down. And what we found was hands down the cleanest valve train I've ever seen on a high mileage diesel. So that day, my faith was made in water methanol injection. And so, you know, that was uh, 2010, 2011 when I wrecked that truck. And so I kind of took that information and put it to good use. And I started selling the crap out of water methanol injection for EGT and engine longevity purposes. And so when I moved to uh, Seattle, Washington, and I'm working in the shop and we obviously deletes aren't an option. And uh, 
I got to kind of figure out how to make these farmers happy. I got to figure out how to get these trucks that are stuck in, in traffic for long hours. They're idling. Uh, that's inevitable. You can't avoid that in Seattle. So how do you make it live? And so I started selling these people water methanol injection systems and we were tearing them down every 30,000 miles and inspecting the EGR valves, the EGR pipes, uh, comparing it to a truck without water methanol injection. And what we found on a LLY Duramax in particular, uh, same customer owned both trucks. His wife drove one truck to and from Seattle every day for work. And he was using the other truck on the farm, hauling horses. Uh, we put water methanol on his dually, her single rear wheel we didn't mess with. And we took the two trucks apart 60,000 miles after installing the water methanol on his truck. And what we found was on the intake, you could stick two fingers in his pipe and not get any soot on your hand. Her pipe, you couldn't even stick your pinky finger in there. That's how encapsulated the EGR tube was going into the intake of the engine. So that's soot buildup at the intake. Super awesome for your valve train. Um, so that's my number one go-to when people are like, hey, I'm towing heavy. I'm out on the road. I need something for a little more power. I need something to help clean this stuff out. So a water methanol kit, it's got really good horsepower boost. Um, if it's There's a lot that goes into it, how you tune the kit, uh, the mix ratio, 60-40, 70-30, 50-50 where you can play around with the water methanol and the water content. Uh, but that's something that I've used for the last 10 years in the industry, and it's worked great. I've never had a customer call back pissed off that they invested in water methanol. Which which kits do you like that are on the market? Because I'm not too familiar with them. I know way back in the day I would look them up, but what do you like, you know, what do you like now? So I've sold uh, – I've only ever sold Snow Performance. Uh, they sold out to Nitrous Express a couple of years ago. So if you want to find them, if you type into Google Snow Performance, you're going to get a bunch of uh, European or Japanese spam websites. Somebody bought the URL and screwed it all up. Uh, so if you go to Nitrous Express on their website, and this is not a sponsored ad, um, <laughs> it's just they've, they're, they're the people that have it and they work. I only sell the Stage 3 MPG Max kit. Uh, it's the most effective. It's the easiest to set up and understand from a customer standpoint. And once you get it dialed in, you can literally set it to where so the kit comes with a seven gallon reservoir. You can dial it in to where seven gallons of water methanol lasts exactly one tank of fuel. So you're not you're not having to pull over on the side of the interstate and fill this thing up. And you're not having to keep an eye on a low level warning light. You know, if you're getting low on fuel, you're getting low on water methanol and you just top it off. Now, does your experience with what it does to the systems, does it apply to a wide range of trucks? Like I imagine people listening, somebody's going to have like a 2017 Power Stroke, somebody a 2015 Ram, maybe somebody a 2021 Duramax, or even going back farther. So as it, as we go through the different, you know, kind of year ranges and you know, almost evolution of the emission systems, are the results the same on them? They are, 100%. It's very universal. Um, I don't even understand. So if anybody's out there <laughs> looking for a kit and you can't find something in stock get out of the mindset of ford chevy dodge that doesn't apply to water methanol it's a very simple system it's a tank it's a pump it's a control unit and three nozzles that's it it doesn't matter if it's a ford part number a chevy part number dodge part number uh universal part number they're all the same components in a box i don't know why they label them different i don't know why they complicated with year specific part numbers it's the stupidest thing i've ever seen so if you can find a kit it'll work on your truck um and, and so that was kind of my early, uh, my earliest experience of, of making, of selling a customer a product that works. I'm not a salesman. I'm a diesel enthusiast stuck on a phone. So I respect my customers' hard-earned dollars just as much as I respect my own. Um, I've had opportunities to be paid on commission. I refuse to because I don't want to become a salesman. I want to do what's right for my customers' hard-earned money. Uh, you cannot go wrong with water methanol injection. The only downside to it, if you're looking at it in the grand scheme of things, is you're installing a product that has to be fed. So people get pissed off that they have to put DEF in their vehicle. If you're that guy, you're probably not going to like water methanol injection because you've got to put it in there. Uh, the difference is it's $1.29 a gallon instead of whatever DEF is currently, 9 bucks or something like that. So it's affordable, but you do have to constantly feed it. You know, if a customer wanted to know what's a product I can do to get, you know, 
uh, more efficiency out of my emissions equipped vehicle uh, and not have to feed it, I would recommend things like high flow exhaust manifolds, uh, better intercoolers, um, cold air intakes. Every diesel truck out there should have a cold air intake on it. I can't tell you how many L5Ps we have in the shop right now where the air filter is literally sucked in and shaped like a U because it's so restrictive and the turbo is pulling so hard on it and nobody maintains them. We're constantly replacing turbos in these newer trucks because the air filters are so restrictive. So if I was president, everybody would have an SMB air intake on their diesel truck. I mean, it's just Merry Christmas. They work. It's a great upgrade, low end throttle response. Uh, just everything changes when you install a good free flowing cold air intake on a diesel truck. So, you know, anybody out there curious day one, go buy your brand new truck and buy an SMB intake for it. You're never going to be pissed off that you spent that money. They're massively affordable. They're made out of the best grade quality components on the market. Uh, there's other air intake systems out there that use rubber couplers and they dry grout out and they crack, they fall apart. You're sucking chunks of rubber through a turbo. SMB, that's never going to happen. They're using silicone uh, boots and, and they just last forever. I've got a 97 F3, F250 with a SMB on it. It's got 353,000 miles on it and it looks the same today as it did the day I put it in. I think people like the small things that you can possibly do to avoid some of these some of these issues and i know that you know with diesel truck owners are they're so varied in how they use them there are those guys like you said who are always towing hauling and they largely escape some of the emissions or maintenance you know issues that can arise but there's also that sizable group where they need it to tow a trailer but they're driving it you know every day <clears throat> like you said 10 miles to work or maybe they just enjoy it they just like it and sure. i go next to the dpf and i wanted to ask you having been in this industry for so long as you think back to the early emission systems, especially on the Dodge trucks and how they've progressed. And I know the big three have to where now they're better than they were, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. But when it comes to the DPF and it's not, you can't, it's just clogged. Uh, there's nothing that, you know, you can do for running it hard. What kind of options do people have? Like I've had some guests on talking about, you know, how they're removed and they can take them to a cleaning place and they're cleaned out. Is that something that's viable? Is it something you're seeing yeah. popping up more places? How does that all work? We, we do it. We do it weekly. Um, we got a, we've actually started to make the investment into that equipment ourselves. Um, so we bought a massive, probably the biggest ultrasonic cleaner that you can get. Um, ultrasonic cleaning gets in there and and so you're energizing chemicals with electricity um, that's a whole episode in and of itself but an ultrasonic cleaner has the ability to get in there and break down those those soot molecules and particles that have built up in the filter in a way that nothing else can um, there's other things you have to have to do that efficiently we found out the hard way you know first we were just <laughs> We didn't know anything about a DPF, you know, you've been in an, we've been in an industry for 15 years where you just throw it in the trash and the problem's gone. Uh, mainly because the government has done an absolutely horrific job of doing their job. Um, you know, being a lay person and a dumbass redneck from Montana, I would have never known in a thousand years it was illegal to delete a DPF because my very first experience with deleting a DPF was with the United States government. Um, I didn't even work at a shop, nor did I have a shop. I was very and heavily, he very heavily involved with forestry in the state of Idaho, as they have a really awesome selective timber logging uh, process there. And so you're literally working with Forest Service personnel to go up and select logs that are in areas where maybe there's beetle kill, uh, maybe they got too much water and it's killing cedars off, what have you. Anyways, we're working hand in hand with the Forest Service, and I'm driving around in a souped up. 800 horsepower 59 Cummins with CN diesel all down the side of it. And so these guys are kind of looking at me as like, hey, we're having a lot of problems with these trucks. Uh, they're starting forest fires. Uh, one of the Forest Service guys that I was working with one summer parked his truck on the side of a road and jumped out literally just to take a leak and comes back to a forest fire starting. Luckily, they were able to get it out, um, but they found out that it was from the vehicle. It was a 6'4 power stroke to be exact. And it had gone into regen while I was sitting there. And you've got to think, you know, waist high, dry grass in northern Idaho in the middle of summer. 
doesn't take much to set that stuff off. And so they were literally bringing these things to my house, asking me to put, you know, get rid of this stuff. How do we get rid of this stuff? And I didn't even know at the time because I didn't know what a DPF was. Uh, I was working on 12 valves and 24 valves back then still. And so, you know, my very first experience with DPF problems was a massive one. You know, I got these forest service guys telling me that there's forest service fire or there's forest fires burning up 65 million acres because of a forest service agent taking a piss on the side of the road. That's a nightmare. And so then I saw articles later on in life where the same thing happened in California. 18 wheeler pulls over on the side of the interstate with a blown out tire. Grass touches the diesel particulate filter. It's hot enough. It sets it off. And the next thing you know, people's homes are burning to the ground. So to, to be sitting here now and know that what was being requested of us by government personnel back then is a federal crime is laughable, comical. Um, you know, it just, even, even talking to the EPA agents that came into the shop, I, I told them that story and they looked at, like, they literally looked guilty, you know, like we're idiots. We're enforcing something that we haven't properly enforced for 15 years and government agencies have been paying for these services and they're breaking the law. So when you start telling an EPA agent that, you know, government agencies are breaking the laws that you're trying to enforce on us, makes for a very awkward office situation. So I, I never received any answers to those questions either, by the way. Um, rules for, for, for thee and not for me, you know, it's just bizarre to me, but it's just, there, it's a major problem for us as, as, private vehicle owners but the problems are much bigger than farmer john trying to feed his cows and he can't leave his truck idling while he kicks a hay bale off the back all morning at five miles per hour across the hay pasture you know those are the real world problems the problems are much larger than that the problems are forest fires the problems are government vehicles breaking down trying to respond to an emergency uh, but if you don't you know for the guys that are wanting to make these things more efficient i think the number one suggestion that i would make right now is smb cold air intake and get a good emissions present tune from Corey willis I, I think he's massively ahead of the game on that um motor ops i believe they have emissions present tuning as well uh, duramax tuner motor ops whatever so there's companies out there that saw this coming down the pipeline um and jumped ahead of it and those are the guys that have years of experience, years of testing. So if you're going to buy custom tunes for your $90,000 truck, don't get them off the Facebook hero on the local L5P page. If you're going to pay for tunes for your hard-earned money that you know are going to go on your $90,000 truck, go to a guy like Corey Willis. It's got the experience. He's got the knowledge. He's got the testing. He's not going to blow your shit up. Um you know, Duramax Tuner, again, those guys, they've they've been they've got years of experience doing emissions present tuning. Let those guys tune your truck. You know, that's a big truck payment. That's a big responsibility. Don't go cheap on tunes. Don't go cheap on parts. I, I get calls all the time. What's the cheapest program I can get for my truck? And I'm like, go look at your payment. Go look at the paperwork you signed with the dealership and and Think about that and say that question again, because that's the dumbest crap I've ever heard. What is the cheapest part for my $90,000 truck? Are you kidding me? What is the best quality part for your truck? What is the best tune for your truck? I've got trucks lined up behind our shop right now with blown up transmissions and blown up engines because they can't get good quality tuning from all the big tuners. And so they're getting just shade tree tunes, delete tunes from idiots on the Internet that are tuning in their grandma's basement wearing a dirty wife beater that's disgusting don't buy tunes from them people buy tunes from reputable companies you're gonna have a bad time if you buy a cheap town i had a really <clears throat> interesting experience recently i was tagging along with uh, a friend and they stopped by a, a chevy dealer for uh for something <clears throat> and it was taking a little bit of time so i'm like i'm gonna walk around a little bit and i haven't really walked around a dealership in quite a while but i remember you probably do too You'd walk into a dealership and they'd say, well, what color you want? And, you know, maybe you want silver, you want black, you want white, red. You walk to a whole row and there's 10 red ones. And they go, you want leather? You know, do you want the work truck model? What do you want? 
and I, I'm not in the market, but you know, the guy said, Hey, well, you know, what do you want to look at? I said, well, let me check out a Duramax. They had two they had a silver one and a red one. That was it. And yeah, I looked crazy. at the sticker on it and you're right. They're not cheap <laughs> at all. And just for a second there, I was thinking, you know, if I did, if I was going to buy this, I would probably approach it entirely different than I did when I was 25 buying one or 30 buying one because yeah. one, I don't know when, you know, you get what you get or you got to wait a long time. And then two is the price of them are so high. Like I want to put the best thing, the best parts, whatever upgrades I may want to do on that truck because it's, I mean, you know, you could get them in the early 2000s. I think somebody knew bought one then it was like a seven, three brand new. It was like 35. I think I paid yeah, 38 I the, for my Ram. You know? I have the window sticker out of my 05 F350 and the window sticker on that truck in 05, fully loaded Lariat, sunroof, four door, long bed, single rear wheel, every factory option you could get back then. It's like 42. And can you imagine paying 42,000 for a six liter? Like, I remember talking to a very good friend of mine, worked at the, uh, Ford dealership in Missoula, Montana, Bitterroot Motors. I bought a brand new truck for him when I was 16 through our company fleet account. Got me a brand new 99. Roll up windows, manual transmission, and rubber floors, vinyl bench seat. Cheapest truck I could find. I was 16. Trying to build credit. And we were putting massive miles on those trucks. You know, we're, we're hauling timber frame home packages to Jackson Hole. Aspen, Colorado, uh, we did the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Bachelor Gulch, Colorado. It was one of the first jobs I did, big jobs I did. We did the Four Seasons Hotel in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. So we're putting 100, 110,000 miles a year on these trucks. And so they had us set on a program where we traded them in every 12 months. And so mine got traded in every year about a week before Christmas. So it was kind of like a new, new truck for Christmas every year kind of a deal. <laughs> and I worked my way up to the Lariats and everything. And I remember him calling me in 2003 and he said, man, he's like, you need to bring your truck in, bring your O2 in. You need to trade it in on the nicest truck on the lot because it's going to be the last power stroke you're ever going to own. And I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, dude, they got us going to classes. These six liters are going to be trash. They're going to be garbage. They're going to suck. We're having nothing but problems with the engines. They're not even selling them yet. And so you know, now I work at a shop that specializes in making six liters reliable. So of course I have one. It's, it's been gone through all the problems have been fixed and it's been a fantastic truck. One of the most reliable I've ever owned. And this is coming from a diehard. You couldn't tell me nothing Cummins guy. When I moved here, you know, you and I talked when you were ATS. I mean, you were a diehard Cummins guy. I was a diehard Cummins guy. So, you know, when you were at ATS, if you joked around and told me I'd own a six liter someday, I'd, I'd be massively offended. But, uh, you know, it's uh, we've even got them working with emissions. So we're not deleting EGRs on six liters anymore. We're bringing deleted six liters in and we're putting catalytic converters back on them. Uh, we're using the CARB EO certified MAGA flow catalytic converters and we're using bulletproof diesels, uh, EGR coolers. And we're not having comebacks. They don't come back. They run fine. They make good power. Uh, six liter is very affordable to put back to federal emissions. So anybody out there that's got a 6.0 that's worried about emissions testing or emissions coming to your state or getting pulled over and not having emissions, you're looking at a couple hundred bucks and some labor to put it back to a legal uh, federal operating vehicle. That was the next thing I wanted to ask you about because that was probably, gosh, I've, I've read it so many times over the last six weeks, is either somebody buys a truck or they're just asking kind of the preemptive question. If I want to put my my truck back to stock, you know, what am I looking at? How do I how do I do it? Um, and I know there's been some stories out there in magazines and other things with you know, a major story in a I think it was in New Jersey, um, you know, where the state said, "Hey, you got to put this truck back to stock." And I'm sure people come into your shop and ask you that question, or you've priced it out before. What are yeah. you looking at if if you know it's just a truck that you have or you bought? It doesn't have any of the parts, and you got to put it all back what does that cost so that's actually happening more and more here uh georgia is not an emissions state we don't have emissions testing here there's one county that i'm aware of that you have to get an emissions test but but it's only on like medium duty and heavy duty diesel trucks so like your f650s and your 18 wheelers 
I don't know anywhere in the state of Georgia that you got to take a Duramax, you know, a Chevy 2500 or a Ford F250 in to do emissions testing on. But what's happening, and I don't know why I, this is a massive assumption um, for clarity's sake, but we got a call from a customer a couple of years ago, uh, had an LML Duramax. He said his daughter was driving back from Atlanta. They live out here in the country. And she was driving back from Atlanta and she was pulled over by GSP for the sole reason that there was soot on the quarter panel of their 2016 Chevrolet. That was the reason she was pulled over. Um, the officer knew everything about the emissions of the vehicle, uh, literally pulled the girl over, young girl, still in high school, calls her dad, obviously freaked out. This officer's telling her there's parts missing off the truck. She doesn't know anything about the truck, nor, nor should she. So the dad calls me freaking out, and he's like, man, what do I do? You know, I bought the truck this way. I don't know what a diesel particulate filter is. I don't know what EGR is. I don't know what a tuner. There's no tuner on the truck that I'm aware of. He bought it off the lot like this. So he has no clue that he's broken any law, but yet his daughter's being detained on the side of the highway, being told she needs to get a ride and they're going to impound the truck. So I told him, I said, well, you need to tell the officer that you purchased a vehicle that way. And I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if you get a fix it ticket, if you get told to put it back to stock. I got off the phone with him. I priced out all the parts and I never heard from the dude again. So I have to assume that telling the officer that they purchased the vehicle that way got him out of trouble. Um, and it didn't come to us to get put back to stock. However, we have put a lot of trucks back to stock, uh, mainly fleet vehicles, a lot of fleet vehicles. So we have a couple big accounts with power companies, uh, power co-ops, uh, maintenance companies that drive diesel trucks, paving companies, uh, landscaping. It's huge here. We do a ton of landscape fleet vehicles. Most of these companies have an in-house diesel tech. And so what has commonly been the case and what anybody out there listening and watching this will agree with before they knew about the EPA, before they knew that this was illegal, the go-to fix was take the faulty part off, throw it in the trash, and put a non-faulty part back on. And so that was happening all across the country. Well, then the EPA starts cracking down on people, and all of a sudden you've got these, these fleet managers that are like, oh, my God, we got 20 deleted trucks. we got to put them back to stock before we get busted. And so we've been doing a lot of them. Uh, we've been the local power company. We've put We've put diesel particulate filters and emissions equipment back on maybe 200 trucks. Um, I'm wow. spitballing because I'm one of three guys on the phone at the shop. So, you know, my experience, I've probably sold 200 vehicles to put back to stock. I don't know what the rest of the guys at the shop have done. I don't keep track of that, but it's expensive. It is massively expensive. It's the newer trucks are actually cheaper. So the guys out there with like a, Dodge is the most expensive. Um, I've got some prices here that I jotted down before I left the office today. So these are straight from the dealership prices. If you have an 07 to 12 Dodge Ram, the EGR cooler, to put an EGR cooler back on your truck is $2,105. The EGR bypass valve is $1,335. The EGR valve on the intake manifold on the intake elbow is $1,925. There's $100 worth of gaskets involved. There's $240 worth of flimsy little heat shields that obviously as you're doing a delete, you're mangling these things, you're prying on them, you're throwing them in the trash. Yeah, you just threw away $240 worth of heat shields. The EGR support bracket that cradles the EGR cooler is $203. The EGR crossover pipe, a hollow pipe with two flanges on it, is $365. There's two clamps that hold that pipe on. Those two clamps cost $327 a piece, $660 worth of clamps. And then you've got the exhaust connector piece, which is $788. That's a little cast piece that comes off the manifold with the two holes in it. Yeah. $788 for a piece of cast iron. So all said and done, if you just had to put the EGR back on your 2007 to 2012 Ram, you have $8,436 just in parts, no labor. 
Now you move on to the diesel particulate filter. The downpipe that has the pre-catalyst in it is $1,540. The catalytic converter is $6,170. They're not in stock. They're on back order because all across this wonderful country, people are cutting these things out with sawzalls and hotel parking lots and driveways and stealing them. And the manufacturers can't keep up with the supply and demand, so they don't exist. So $6,170 for the cat. The diesel particulate filter itself is $1,870. The muffler is $397. The tailpipe is $399. The over-the-axle pipe is $399. That little 18-inch section of mid-pipe between the catalytic converter and the DPF, $209 and a $21 gasket. So you got $10,606 in parts just to put a stock exhaust back on an 07 Ram. If you total the EGR and the DPF together, it's $19,000 to put that truck back to stock. No labor. That's just in parts. Wow, I didn't think that EGR valve was that expensive. That's the part that goes on the intake manifold then. Yes. <clears throat> 1900 yep. bucks. Yep. So it's just, it's astronomical. And, you know, these co-ops, these corporations, these fleets are having to pay that kind of money to put these trucks back to stock to keep them in operation. Otherwise, they're sending them to auction. And it's a, it's a total loss, you know. So it's, uh, it's massively expensive to go back to stock. Um, the Fords, surprisingly, are the cheapest. Um, I looked up a 2018 Ford 6.7 Power Stroke, all the parts to put one of them back to stock. And we've done a bunch of them because most of the fleet vehicles in our area are Ford. Ambulances, fire trucks, power co-ops. Uh, a 2018 Ford to put it back to stock, full EGR system, full diesel particulate filter, catalytic converter, all the sensors, exhaust brackets, muffler, tailpipe everything to put a 2018 Ford back to stock is only $9,472. So pretty cheap compared to the Cummins, but you know, that's every one of those parts says FOMOCO on it. And Ford produces more diesel vehicles than any other man auto manufacturer in the country. So obviously stuff's going to be a little bit cheaper. Supply and demand's higher. I think where, whenever this subject comes up, we have, I like to, I really like to pay attention to the comments, like on YouTube, especially, <clears throat> and I'll see one kind of set of comments where somebody says, well, I'm never going to put it back to stock. I'm going to keep this truck forever. And then I see the other side that says, well, maybe I do want to get a 2024 Duramax. I really like the new styling of it or the new power stroke or the new Cummins. I want the CP3 that's in the Cummins. I don't want to stick with my 2015 or 16. And so it's come up on other episodes where when you go to trade this in, they might not take it. The other side of it that I've heard from some guests that work at shops is that have had, you know, been visited by the EPA or, or anything like that is, you know, a truck comes in, it's deleted. I have to put it back to stock or I have to, I have to do these things above and beyond what they're being asked for. So I think the truck owner is catching it from a few different places. One, you know, who doesn't want a newer truck or may want a newer truck. And then two is where can you take it to be worked on? And they get in that position of, I've got to, I've got to do something with it. They, you know, bought the truck like that guy you mentioned. He bought it like that. Well, now he's got to buy all those parts again. So I've, I've heard that as well. And um, when, when the EPA was at our shop, treating us like criminals, assuming we were guilty until we proved that we were innocent. While they were there doing that, I asked that question. There were two Cummins trucks that we had in the shop, fully deleted. EPA dude starts jumping around like a Mexican jumping bean, thinks he's got us. So he makes me go into the front office. I had to pull up those two customers. I had to print out all their invoices from the beginning of time to present, went through them with him, and there was no deletes on there. And so his question to me was, well, if you didn't delete it, who did? I said, well, it's none of my business. First of all, the truck's here for a turbocharger, and that one's here for brakes. And I said, are we allowed to work on it? And I've, I've heard mixed reviews, as you have. I see different shop owners. I've watched your podcast religiously and i've seen all the different things that people are told and it's massively infuriating because i've talked to a good friend of mine that's in law enforcement and his point was you know if 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 as an officer of the law if i pull you over for 
speeding and you have a taillight out or you were not wearing your seatbelt at the time I pulled you over, if you failed to signal changing lanes and I pulled you over for speeding and the only ticket I gave you was for speeding, his point as a law enforcement officer was if you showed up in court and you said, I'd like I'd like the dash cam footage from the incident to be brought in as evidence and they reviewed that dash cam footage and they saw that your taillight was out, they saw that you failed to signal pulling over, they saw that you, I don't know how you'd see that somebody wasn't wearing a seatbelt, but say they could see that. His whole point is, if I didn't fully enforce the law, to my knowledge as a law enforcement officer, you could literally get out of that ticket with the admission of other wrongs. So that was what was really confusing in my dealings with the EPA is, you know, I see the EPA show up and it was not, my head did not go to deletes. My head did not go to programmers. I was like, is our oil collection system up to par? Is our chemical waste disposal up to par? Like, are we doing things right that maybe we're a little lax on? And so when we walked out in the shop, I, I was kind of, Pointing them in that direction, like, well, this is where we store our coolant. This is where we store our waste oil. This is our drainage system. This is the leach field that it put. They didn't care about any of that. They didn't. They weren't there to make sure that we were doing good for the environment, which we are. We've always been very aware of that. We've always had catch tanks. We've always had good filtration. We make sure that no oil gets spilled. If oil gets spilled, we have very expensive products that we keep on hand to absorb that oil and soak it up out of the ground as fast as possible. They didn't care about any of that. They just wanted to find deletes. They just kept asking me about defeat devices, defeat devices. We didn't have any. We we weren't doing deletes. We actively quit. We were told that it was illegal. We stopped doing it. So they didn't care about the things that I thought they would care about. That was very confusing. On top of that, after I asked if we could work on the vehicle, I was told yes. So I know other shops have been told differently. Um, we had 14 deleted vehicles on our lot the day that they showed up. None of them had we done. I printed all those customers' invoices out. We reviewed them with the agents. There was no question. We had not deleted those vehicles. Uh, we had serviced those vehicles. We had done brake jobs on those vehicles. We had installed transmissions in those vehicles. We had repaired turbochargers on those vehicles. We had done head gaskets on those vehicles. So I asked, I said, well, what's what's the rule? If a truck comes in here deleted and the customer bought it that way, they don't have the parts to put back on. They can't afford $20,000 in parts to put it back on. What do I have to tell that customer? And his answer to me was there was a blue sinister diesel EGR blocker plate on the intake manifold of the one Dodge. He pointed right at it. And he said, do you have to take that part off to replace the turbo? No, no, that I will never touch that part. There's not a repair on this truck that would require me to touch that blocker plate. And so that what, that's what we were told by a law enforcement officer. And so that's all I have to go off of. Um, so as long as we're not removing a defeat device and putting it back on, we can work on that vehicle and do anything we need to do to it as long as we don't touch the no-no parts. So that's what we've gone off of. Uh, I hope we're following the law properly. It wasn't very well displayed to us and it wasn't very well explained to us. I did ask him about 20 questions that he couldn't answer, uh, which is frustrating. Um, can I rape somebody? No. Okay. Uh, are we allowed to put 40 inch tires on? You can't install any part that changes or alters the way the vehicle ran from the day that it left the factory. Okay, so we cannot install 40 inch tires. Yeah, they're tires. It alters the way the vehicle ran from the factory, sir. So can I or can I not install 40 inch tires? Um, uh, I've, I don't have that portion of the law. That wasn't in my PowerPoint presentation. You're a fucking clown. You don't know what you're doing and you're here to enforce law, it was, I was embarrassed for him. This is not my enemy by any means. This is a nice young man trying to do his job. I'm trying to do my job. He could not tell me what I could and couldn't do because he didn't understand the laws that he's enforcing. That's what's frustrating. As a person that's followed the law my entire life, I'm now being accused or assumed to be a criminal by this law enforcement officer 
yet he cannot tell me what is and isn't legal. All he can tell me is the law. And I'm teaching him how the products that we're installing break that law, but he doesn't think a 40 inch tire is a problem. It's a massive problem. If yeah. you're going to enforce the law, force the law to its entirety. And I would love to have a chat with Stuart about that. As a man that does understand the law, I'm still a dumbass redneck from Montana that I could build a hell of a barbed wire fence. I do not teach or study law. I, I don't know what's right and wrong at the end of the day. There's a million laws in this country, and this is the problem. There's laws about how you dispose of an aerosol can. You and me have been throwing them in the trash, along with the toilet paper, for 30-some-odd years. We're breaking laws, but nobody's enforcing it. That's one of the toughest parts about questions <clears throat> pertaining to you know, these episodes or other ones. Is somebody will ask, well, can I run 40-inch tires or 37s or 39s, what, 38s, whatever size it might be? And it's like, I don't know. I've asked that question. It, it, it varies a lot. I just I, I, I get the... I get the impression that the way the industry has pivoted is that people want to know, like we started with, is how do I maintain it? What can I do so I don't run into having to buy a, you know, nineteen thousand dollars worth of EGR and DPF parts because they're not they're not hot rodding it or anything like that. They're just driving it every day. Or right. I have this truck. Um, I want to put it back to stock. How do I do it? And I think that's a you know, a choice people are going to have to make, but it's, it's something that, um, you know, doing a podcast and, and just chatting about, it, I didn't know. So I thought it'd be great to have you on because you've been doing this for so long in so many different capacities. And then every day you're talking to fleet, you know, fleet managers, um, you know, contractors, truck owners, all three brands are coming into your shop. So you're seeing a lot more of these trucks than, than I ever have or ever will. So I think that gives us a lot of you know, a lot of insight. One that I thought to ask you before we wrap up, you know, somebody's going to ask this is they don't have a truck right now. They're not looking brand new, but they're looking something say from, you know, 2015 to say 2020. And I know it's going to vary based on how the truck was driven, but is between Cummins, Duramax, Power Stroke, is there one that you find in general has less issues with the emission systems than the other two or another one? Um, that's a really good question, and there's not a – there's so I deal in patterns. We see volume. We do 70 to 90 trucks a week, so I see patterns, repetition, and the repetition is not Ford, Chevy, Dodge, and I'm – I grew up way too poor to be picky. You know, we drove whatever got us to and from the job site as a kid now, you know, growing up and making my own money and, and having my own preferences. Uh, I grew up with, power, you know, I, I started out with power strokes. I've had a lot of power strokes. Um, I switched over to Cummins, my wife's dad, my wife's dad and I had a very fun relationship of making fun of each other and jabbing at each other. And we were very good friends and, uh, loved him to death. A uh, huge elk hunter, mountain man. I mean, a total mountain man. And so I had a ton of respect for him. You know, I just got to bang his daughter as a bonus. And, <laughs> you know, he had a he had a 9412 valve, and I used to make fun of him. You know, I put a super chips on my 7.3. I'm out there doing Brody's in his yard, tearing up his grass. I'm like, let's see you do that, you know, and he couldn't, obviously. And we all know what a stock 12 valve Cummins is. So his last dying joke on me was to gift me a 9412 valve. And so very quickly my interest was peaked and I learned a lot about Cummins motors very rapidly. Uh, one thing I learned is they're very easy to work on compared to a power stroke. So I tore the pump apart, built the pump, did everything I could possibly do to the pump, bought all my parts from Brady, um, put a turbo on it, put a South Bend clutch in it. Uh, Peter's, Peter from South Bend was one of the greatest dudes in this industry. He's just a freaking legend. And uh, he always made sure that I had clutches in my trucks that would hold power. And uh, if I could tear it up, he'd send me a better clutch. And so I played around with that 12 valve until inevitably it killer dial pin fell out. The one thing I should have fixed that I was slacking on and it wiped out the motor. And so I learned a lot about Cummins and I, I have a massive knowledge of, of power strokes 
I went to work at Alligator. Chad, freaking super good dude, taught me a ton about Duramaxes. So I don't think, in the grand scheme of things, just if we're all being honest, all BS aside, Ford Chevy Dodge doesn't matter. Um, Dodge has their place. They're affordable. They're cheap. Um, you know, 94 to 2009, they were just a, a shit box with a great motor in it. Uh, 2010, they really stepped up their game. They came out with some just fantastic interior, uh, electronic amenities, heated and cooled seats. That was neat. GM, independent front suspension, they ride good. Um, I don't think they ride good enough to base my whole reason of buying a Duramax off the front suspension, but to the viewers out there, they're all junk. That's why I have a job. That's why this podcast exists. Um, they're all garbage. They all have their problems. The aftermarket industry that's being crucified right now uh, by the EPA exists because they're all junk. So as diesel enthusiasts, I think we all took it upon ourselves to make sure that if, that, if we were aware of a faulty factory part, we go out of our way we do massive amounts of research to figure out why it's a piece of junk part. And we try to give our customer an aftermarket option that ensures that that never happens to them again. Uh, that's where deletes came from. That's where, and, and it was allowed to run rampant for so long because the government was not doing their job because they were not properly enforcing these laws because they were not properly educating the diesel industry. And I'm not just talking performance shops. I can, I can tell you this from from my massive amount of history in, in the diesel world. I can't tell you one customer that ever came into our shop and was like, middle finger to the man, I want to delete my truck just to break the law. Never happened. That has never happened. It's never going to happen. If somebody did that, I would run them out of our shop. That's not the kind of clientele I want. Uh, I think government has its place. I think it's become... It's run rampant, and we're currently dealing with a mafia situation because it's illegal to delete a truck. It's a not to delete. The deletes is not the problem. That's not the law they're enforcing. The problem is they're telling us it's illegal to modify the vehicle in any way, shape, or form. It's illegal to purchase, install, offer to sell, or sell any device or part that alters the way the vehicle ran from the day it left the factory. That's the law as it was written. That's not what's being enforced because you can pay a fee, a fee to break the law. That's the mafia. You can pay, Corey Willis is currently paying testing fees to break the specific law that they are enforcing. It's illegal to tune a vehicle and alter the way it ran from the factory but if you pay all these testing fees and you go through this nightmare of government, now you're allowed to break the law. You can pay to break the law. That to me is dirty. I, if, if I slip a hundred dollar bill to a police officer that pulls me over for speeding, I've just broken another law. So that bothers me. Um, I don't know how that's okay, but it is. That's the law. I mean, <laughs> it's not the law, but that's what's happening. So, I feel like the diesel industry, the laws need to change, period, end of story. And the law enforcement officers that are out there need massive education and restructuring. Um, I think some diesel shop owners, instead of these guys hiding and acting like criminals after they're accused of a crime, stop acting like criminals and stop acting like you've been breaking the law. You didn't know the law. The law was not properly enforced by law enforcement. And you inevitably broke it trying to do what was best for your customer. So stop being victims and start calling it the way it is. You didn't know. I didn't know until the EPA showed up to our shop and laid it out in black and white. This is the law. Then what I found out very quickly is they don't know the law. They don't understand the law. They don't know if we're breaking the law. All they know is defeat devices. They know some brand names that they saw in their PowerPoint presentation. They know some pictures of parts that they saw in their PowerPoint presentation. And if they saw those laying around our shop, they pointed them out. Um, the part 
they got the most excited about <laughs> in the little visit we had was a set of factory Ford six liter up pipes. He picked them up. He said, this is an EG Yard Elite. I said, no, it's not. He said, yes, I saw this in our PowerPoint presentation. It's not an EG Yard Elite, man. And I grabbed it from him and I turned it around and I showed him the tag that said FOMOCO with a part number. This is a factory Ford part. No, it's not. It's an EG Yard Elite. Like this dude was sticking to his guns. Good for him. I had to take him to the truck, show him the truck that the part came off of. And then I showed him where, if it was an EGR delete, where that part would attach to this part, but that was on a totally separate part that attaches to this part, and a totally separate part had to attach to that part to be a delete. So that they don't even know what they're doing, and they're out there enforcing the law. They're ruining people's lives, and they do not know what they're doing. So they need to befriend us as diesel enthusiasts and experts and start teaching us the law so we can be compliant with it first foremost and then once we all are working together cohesively to make sure that we're all obeying the laws i want to obey the law i don't there's not one morning that i've woken up out of my bed and walked out the front door of my house like i'm gonna break the law today it's never happened it's never going to happen you know everything that i do in life i try to follow the law as well as i can I don't speed. I don't murder people. I don't steal. Uh, I tried it once when I was eight. I have a horrible guilty conscience. I was going through growing pains as a little kid, and I thought God was breaking my legs because I stole a pack of bubble gum from the store. I'm the most unguilty <laughs> person on this planet. I just want to take care of my customers, do what's right for them. I want to spend their money wisely. I want to ensure that we're not creating problems as a diesel shop. And I can no longer do that because I don't understand the law and the people enforcing it don't understand what we do and they don't understand the law. And so that is massively frustrating. So we're sitting here putting super crappy parts back on our customers trucks that we know are going to fail. And I'm telling the customer flat out, I cannot help you. I, I cannot delete your vehicle. I cannot tune your vehicle unless it's a CARB EO certified device or a CARB EO certified tune. <clears throat> so we're no longer selling the best products on the market. We're selling the products that have paid the fine to the mafia and they're not good parts. And I don't like that. I don't like that for our customers. I don't like that for the industry. And uh, it's very frustrating. Well, <clears throat> I appreciate your time today answering those two major questions. They both popped up from two different two different guys, like almost back to back. And I thought of of you immediately to have on to to answer those you know, with your experience. So I always appreciate your insights, shedding some light on a few different things that people can do to you know make their emissions components last, and then also have an understanding of you know what it costs to put it back to stock if if that's something that uh, you know they're going to be dealing with so again it was awesome to chat with you Vinny. enjoy our <clears throat> our time the education that i get from it and i'm sure we will do it again in the future sounds good brother happy to be on don't forget diesel fans make sure and head on over to kershaw.kiausa.com use code diesel 20 to be able to save 20 percent off site-wide we appreciate our friends over there offering this discount code just for you guys it's uh something that they wanted to make sure our audience could save some money if they were looking for knife or edc hunting fishing the job site around the house so we appreciate them doing that i also want to give a shout out to a couple of our patreon supporters tyler low and a 23 diesel also, Caleb, we appreciate their support, all of our Patreons, all of you who listen on YouTube, podcast apps, follow us on Instagram, Facebook. You guys are the reason we do this podcast. We love hearing from you and knowing what you guys want to you know, know about, know more about, learn about your trucks. So to definitely make sure, reach out to us if you have questions, you want to hear from a guest, want to hear an episode covered, let us know. We love to hear from you. Until next time, keep the shiny side up.